So I'm going to be talking about two seemingly unrelated concepts. Uh, and those are transversal gates for uh, error correcting codes and quantum homomorphic encryption, which is quite a mouthful, but we'll define these terms and uh, sort of get into it. But uh, this is joint work with Yai and Shi, and we're at the University of Michigan, like Tom said. Uh, so just as some motivation, um, <coughs> this conference is in part testament to the fact that quantum computation can sometimes offer information theoretic security guarantees that are impossible classically. And so a reasonable question to ask is if fully homomorphic encryption, which is this re really useful cryptographic protocol, um, can be done with information theoretic security. Uh, and a seemingly unrelated question, uh, so it's known that no error correcting code has a transversal and quantum universal gate set. Um, and this is really too bad because transversal gates are kind of the gold standard in quantum fault tolerance. So the gates where um, you have the least amount of overhead when you implement these gates. Um, and so a reasonable follow-up question, well, we know that a lot of useful quantum algorithms, like Shor's algorithm, are dominated by classical gates. And so are there any error correcting codes that can implement large sets of classical gates transversely? Uh, or in particular, are there any quantum codes that can implement the Toffley gate transversely, since Toffley is universal for uh, reversible computing? Uh, so just as an outline of what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to define these sort of unwieldy terms. So I'm going to talk about what homomorphic encryption is and then transversal gates for quantum codes. Uh, we're going to link these two things via a homomorphic encryption scheme uh, that was proposed by Ouyang, Tan, and Fitzsimmons in 2015. And it relates homomorphic encryption to quantum codes and transversal gates. Um, we're then going to observe limitations on information theoretically secure homomorphic encryption with quantum assistance. And through this connection, we're going to impose those limitations on transversal gate sets for quantum codes. And finally, I'll talk about some of the caveats to this work, uh, along with uh, some future directions. OK, so to get started, you'll probably hear more about this in the next talk. But really informally, homomorphic encryption is a way that uh, a party, Alice, can delegate computation of some function f on some data uh, to a second party, Bob, without sacrificing the privacy of that data. Um, so in particular, a homomorphic encryption system allows Alice to encrypt her data and send that data off to Bob. Bob can apply some evaluation on the ciphertext directly, so manipulating the ciphertext. And when she sends this back to Alice when she decrypts, she finds that magically the function f has been applied correctly to her underlying plain text. And so in particular, this magic is exactly what homomorphic encryption is. Uh, a, a scheme is homomorphic for function f um, if essentially there's some evaluation function which co commutes with the encryption and decryption function. So if there's some evaluation function, you can apply to the ciphertext, which correctly applies uh, the function you want on the underlying plain text. Um, and there are more uh, qualities that you'd like your homomorphic encryption scheme to have. Um, and these can, in this talk, be summarized by saying that uh, you don't want Alice's work to scale too much uh, with the evaluation function that Bob's applying. If she's delegating the computation in the first place, she certainly doesn't want to be doing the computation herself. Um, and more specifically, in this talk, we're going to be considering compact and non-leveled schemes. And this is very important that these two things are, uh, hold. Um, and so classically, while you'd want to homomorphically implement uh, functions on bits, quantumly, we're in, in, interested in implementing uh, unitaries on qubits. So a lot of progress has been made on quantum homomorphic encryption. Um, and in the computational security uh, setting, I just want to point out this recent result from, the la from last year uh, by the authors of most of the authors from the next paper, which is fully homomorphic encryption for polynomial size circuits. So this is really great. But all these schemes uh, rely on um, classical homomorphic encryption as a subroutine. And so they inherit the security of that encryption scheme. Uh, and in particular, that encryption scheme is you know, it's, it's computationally secure. And this isn't really a knock on it, because it's secure. Uh, it uses hard lattice problems for security. And we saw from our first talk that hard lattice problems are expected to be quantum hard. But still, you might ask for a stronger information theoretic security guarantee. And in this setting, uh, I want to point out this paper, which uh, sort of uh, inspires a lot of the arguments here by Ouyang Tan and Fitzsimmons. And so what they propose is a homomorphic encryption scheme for Clifford circuits plus a constant number of T gates. And so just as a reminder, Clifford plus T gates is a universal set for quantum computing. Um, and the security guarantee is very strong. And the guarantee is that the uh, trace distance between any two ciphertexts is exponentially suppressed. And this was later extended uh, by Lai and Chung in 2017, this past year, uh, using similar techniques and with a similar security guarantee, but homomorphically implementing IQP circuits, or an extension of those, which is nice since IQP circuits are probably not classically simulable unless the polynomial, polynomial hierarchy collapses to some level. So this is really great. So we have all this intermediate uh, progress towards information theoretically secure homomorphic encryption. And so you might ask, well, is it possible to do fully homomorphic encryption with information theoretic security guarantees? 
And unfortunately, this seems not to be the case. So this is a strong no-go theorem from 2014 by you, Perez, Delgado, and Fitzsimmons, which says that if you demand perfect security, by which I mean the mutual information between your ciphertext and your plain text is precisely zero, then you can't do homomorphic encryption, even with quantum assistance, efficiently. Um, but still, we saw in the OTF scheme, like I mentioned, that you have this epsilon information theoretic security. And in that sense, you were able to implement a large set of homomorphisms. Um, Unfortunately, it turns out that even when you do this epsilon relaxation, you still can't have efficient fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and so here and in that LC17 paper, we independently observed that um, this can't be done. And it essentially follows from private information retrieval bounds that were extended to the quantum setting in a paper in 2013. OK, so that's it for homomorphic encryption. Now let's switch gears and talk about transversal gates. And if we're going to talk about transversal gates, let's start with error correcting code, since this is a crypto conference. Uh, so an error correcting code, an NKD code, is uh, very simply an encoding of k uh, logical bits into n physical bits, such that if at most d minus 1 over 2 of those bits gets corrupted, um, there exists some recovery channel by which you can perfectly recover your information. And it comes equipped with some fixed orthonormal basis of your choosing. Uh, and in particular, I'll just mention that stabilizer codes are the most frequently considered codes in the literature. And these are just a special class of codes that have a nice presentation in terms of the polygroup. So what are transversal gates? So if you have some code or some code block here for a fixed code, you can have many such code blocks for that same code. Um, and then if you partition those code blocks in such a way that each qubit, uh, or each element of the partition has only one qubit from each code block, um, then a logical gate that decomposes as a product across those code block, uh, across those uh, pieces, or I'm going to call them subsystems, is called transversal. And you can see why these are so valuable, because you can imagine that if this qubit gets corrupted, for example, at most, one other qubit from each code block is going to become corrupted. And in particular, since error correction is done independently on each code block, this is essentially saying that the errors can't grow too far out of hand. Um, and so since these transversal gates are so valuable, a lot of research has been done on what types of transversal gates you can have. And in particular, in the stabilizer framework, there's a ton of really fantastic results, which I'm going to unfairly, summar uh, unfairly summarize as saying that each one is observing some relation between the stabilizer codes and a nested sequence of gate sets called the Clifford hierarchy, which in some sense generalizes the Clifford group. And then, in 2009, there was this famous theorem by Easton and Knill, which says that if you have any fixed size error detecting code, the transversal gate set must be finite, and so it can't approximate the full unitary group to arbitrary precision. Um, but still, we have a lot of quantum codes that can implement, implement large finite groups uh, transversally, the most famous example being like Steen's code, which can implement the set of all Clifford gates transversally. And so we can still ask, to ask for whether or not there are codes which can implement a large or even uh, universal set of classical gates. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not the case either, uh, at least for almost all codes. So here we show, and I'll talk about this almost at the end, that for almost any quantum error correcting code, the transversal gate set can't be classically universal. And whereas the Easton and Knell theorem is a nice Lie type argument, uh, our, the argument we're going to present here is more of an information theoretic quantitative argument that at its heart is an application of Nyack's bound. OK, so we've talked about homework encryption and transversal gates. So how are these things related? So they're related through this, I'm going to say, heuristic that was implicitly proposed in this 2015 paper. Um, and so the idea is that you're going to encode your, uh, you're going to encrypt by first encoding your bit. Um, and you want to have a mixed state encoding. So you're going to inject noise into some encoding for some bit, which you see up here, psi i. And the way that you're going to inject your noise is by applying depolarizing noise to the ancilla bits of the code. And so now you have some new mixed state encoding. And now you're going to take this mixed state encoding, and you're going to embed it into random noise in a very special way. And that way is that um, each of these columns represents a subsystem of this mixed state encoding. And each row into all the shaded in qubits are just going to be a single code block for one of the input bits. And in particular, um, oh, and I, I should mention that all of these not filled in circles represent just max and mixed noise, so just max and mixed qubits. Um, so if your code has a transversal gate that decomposes as an identical product over the subsystems of the code, if it's transversal, um, then Bob, without knowing the locations of the columns, which are the secret key, so these locations are kept secret, he can apply that gate transversally and homomorphically, because the fact that the gate is transversal is exactly saying that um, the noise that you're embedding into is not going to correlate at all with uh, the information that you've, been, that you've uh, encoded inside. And so the fact that these gates are transversal is exactly saying that they can be implemented homomorphically. And so like I mentioned, in 2015 and 2017, this was used to great effect using polynomial, so efficient encoding size, 
uh, to implement the set of all Clifford plus constant T gates and IQP circuits homomorphically with this strong security guarantee. And so we modify this slightly, um, and we'll see why in a bit, but so we choose an error correcting code here, and instead of uh, applying depolarizing noise to the ancilla, we're gonna apply it to the output wires. And this still has the effect of mixing the code, although to a lesser extent, and we'll see that we're gonna pay for this in the security. Um, but we take this new mixed state encoding, and we're gonna uh, embed it into random noise in a very similar way, but with the added guarantee that in each individual, uh, each individual subsystem lies in a particular labeled code block. And so this is gonna allow Bob to essentially implement um, different gates uh, rather than just an identical gate on each individual subsystem. And so what are the effects of these modifications? Well, first of all, it's gonna be homomorphic for all transversal gate sets for that code. And the reason is just because we can see this as essentially applying depolarizing noise to D minus one qubits in known locations. So it's just a, a, a little lemma is that if you have an error correcting code and you know where the errors are, then you can actually correct D minus one errors. Um, and so we can successfully recover the gate applied to the correct, uh, the correct gate applied to the underlying data. And the security is terrible, but it's not trivial. So for almost any quantum error correcting code, you wanna see this as saying that using encoding sizes which are asymptotically less than two to the p, um, the trace distance between any two ciphertexts is gonna to go to zero very, very quickly. Um, and so in spite of this terrible overhead, we'll see that this is exactly what we need in order to argue our bounds on transversal gates. Um, so in order to ar argue those bounds, let's ar first argue about limitations on information theoretically secure quantum homomorphic encryption. So in 2014, it was shown that if you have perfect security and you implement a set of S homomorphisms, then the size of your evaluated ciphertext has to grow as log of S. So if S is like the set of all classical reversible functions, this is gonna be like N times two to the N, which is way too big. Um, so here, and in that uh, LC17 paper that I mentioned, if you let F of P denote the size of the evaluated ciphertext as a function of the input, then if the trace distance between any two ciphertexts is bounded away from one, so you have any security whatsoever, then in fact you see that asymptotically the evaluated ciphertext still has to grow as two to the p. So this is just sort of the epsilon relaxation analog of this theorem up here. And so the ingredient for proving this is something called a quantum random access code. So very informally, an ABC quantum random access code is just an encoding of A classical bits into B quantum bits, such that you can uh, query those B quantum bits for one of the bits of A. So it's essentially a way of uh, compressing classical a, a bits of classical information into B bits of quantum information. Uh, and there's, you can see the formal definition here. Um, and there's this famous theorem by Nyack, which basically says that this compression can't be too efficient. So in particular, if you have any ABC quantum random access code, uh, the number of qubits that you're using up to some error factor has to be essentially this, the number of classical bits that you're using. And so a sketch of the proof for why you can't do efficient information theoretically secure homomorphic encryption even with quantum assistance, you can actually see the evaluated ciphertext for such a scheme as a quantum random access code for the set of all Boolean functions on p bits. So you think of that as just bit strings of size two to the p, where one minus the probability of success for that, for that QREC corresponds to the largest trace distance between any two ciphertexts. So in particular, uh, if the trace distance is small, your probability of success is large, and so your encoding size is large. So you can't hope to do it efficiently. Uh, and then so putting this together with that scheme we talked about before, um, almost no quantum error correcting code can implement even a classical universal gate set transversely. And the proof is very simple. Um, to almost quantum error correcting code, we have that scheme which has uh, security with an encoding size which is asymptotically less than two to the p. The transversal gate sets for the code are those that can be evaluated homomorphically. And we just showed that if you can, uh, if you can homomorphically implement the first full set of uh, classical gates, um, then your encoding size has to asymptotically be two to the p. So this can't happen because it, uh, it would violate an IX bound. Okay, so the exception to the security proof, um, there are these non-stabilizer codes of distance D, which you can think of as the concatenation on the outside of a classical code uh, and some inner code. Um, and these codes are essentially codes for which you can't mix the encoding enough in order to get these uh, small, sufficiently small ciphertexts to argue security. Um, and so a stabilizer example, probably the most famous example, is just Shor's code, which you can see is just the concatenation of some bit flip code with some GHZ state inner encoding. So in summary, um, so we've relaxed a, a no-go theorem about perfect information theoretically secure quantum homomorphic encryption, and we've shown that, well, actually, even in the epsilon relaxation, you still can't have uh, information theoretically secure uh, quantum homomorphic, fully homomorphic encryption. And the reason is because both the evaluated ciphertexts have to grow too quickly. Um, we've also shown that off of this exceptional set, 
Uh, no classical universal gate set uh, can be implemented transversely for almost any code off of this special set. Um, and so things that we'd like to do in the future, uh, certainly we'd like to get rid of these exceptional codes. So they're just kind of a technical hiccup in the proof. We don't think they actually provide a counterexample to the theorem. Um, it would be interesting to characterize uh, information theoretic schemes for other large finite gate sets. So we have Clifford plus T gates, and we've had IQP circuits. And so what else can be done? Um, and also maybe relaxing the security somewhat. So we know now that um, at least for this really rigorous notion of inf information theoretic security coming from trace distance, we can't do too much. So if we relax security to maybe some definition in terms of accessible information or something weaker, uh, can we say more? Um, and fi finally, uh, further understanding more exotic transversal gate sets outside of the stabilizer framework would be interesting. And even more generally, um, understanding sort of the trade-off of what we're observing here, which is that uh, in some sense what we're seeing is that the degree to which a quantum encoding mixes into random noise is in, has some sort of inverse relationship with the complexity of the gate set it can implement transversely. And quantifying this relation would be interesting since this is sort of most, just the most severe case, I would say. Um, and I just want to make it very clear that this, uh, this argument doesn't apply to leveled fully homomorphic encryption, um, which is uh, all we know how to do even in the, even in the computational security setting um, in the quantum regime. Okay, thank you so much.